Good morning, friends. Welcome to Worship with Grace Presbyterian Church, both all of you in person and online. We're delighted that you have chosen to worship the Lord with us on this beautiful summer morning. Just a few announcements before we begin today. If you are visiting with us, we offer you a very special welcome. Hope you will make yourself known to us. Fill out a connection card so that we can connect with you and uh, love you as fellow children of God. We are starting our new schedule next week. So this service will be uh, a contemporary service, mostly, and will begin at 9 a.m. At 10 a.m., we will have Christian formation for all ages, some exciting offerings uh, beginning next week and uh, continuing as they were uh, before pandemic as well. So, um, and there will be um, I, Henry's ice cream next week at 10 o'clock. So come get that and then come visit a new Sunday school class, move around between them next week. Just enjoy and see all that we have to offer. You will have a, a beautiful brochure next week to let you know about all of our offerings. And then we will have um, our later service at 11.05 again, in this room, and that will be mostly traditional. So I, I, I hope you will join us for, for at least one worship next week and Christian education because knowledge is power in the Christian life as in everything else. Two um, activities for our mission committee are coming to fruition. Our school supply drive for Carpenter Middle School is next Sunday, so please bring your donations to worship Drop them off at the mission table in the back of our room. And uh, thank you. Thank you in advance for uh, helping these middle school students have what they need. Two weeks from today is our new MANA event where we will package over 20,000 meals for those in need. We still need 20 more volunteers to join us on uh, Sunday, August 15th from 1.30 to 3.30 or 4 to package those meals. So if you are willing and able please uh, sign up in our mission table at the back for that. We've all heard the news about the Delta variant and it uh, uh, seemingly more virulent than other variants. So uh, you know masks are welcome and even encouraged. Vaccinations are strongly encouraged. And our session is meeting right after worship today to talk about how we want to move forward, uh, whether we require them again or not. So uh, please be in prayer for us as we discern God's will for us in this matter. We are serving communion today for, for the first time without our little individual kits. But uh, I, I've read so many articles about how to do this in a safe way. So I'll, I will ask you to come forward, just space. Um, as you come forward, um, our, one of our elders will place a piece of bread in your hand. And then you will pick up a cup out of the tray yourself. They're spaced far enough where you won't touch another cup. Go ahead and partake. And then there are beautiful black trash cans on each side of the sanctuary, proceed back to your seat via the outside rows, discarding of your cup in the trash can. Uh, the center station will be gluten-free if you require that. Everybody understand? So, all right, great, great. And um, just a reminder, because we are online and those at home would love to enjoy the closing voluntary today, remain seated for that. Or if you need to leave or would like to visit, go out into the hall to do so, okay? That will help everyone at home uh, enjoy what they need to enjoy. Fair warning, today's sermon may step on your toes a little. But I take courage, as I hope you do, from uh, uh, the words uh, from Joshua 1.9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let's prepare our hearts for worship.
Stand with me as we are called into worship. <clears throat> How shall we worship our God? Leave empty talk and pride behind. Prepare to step out in faith, even into troubled waters. Don't be afraid. This is God's world. There is no one even close to our God. Let us worship God. May be seated. Because we trust in God's faithfulness and mercy, we dare to confess our mistakes and failures, call upon God's compassion, and be renewed in God's grace. We pray together using the prayer printed in the bulletin. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, when we would shut our eyes because we are afraid to see when we would hold on tightly because we are afraid to share, when we would close our doors because we are afraid to get involved, forgive us. May we find courage in the promise of your great love for us, in the truth of your call to justice and righteousness, in the community of your people, learning together to open our eyes, our hands, our homes, and our hearts. In these quiet moments, confess to God when you have not had the courage to speak up or take a stand for what is right. Amen. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Believe the good news of the gospel.
not an easy peace, not an insignificant peace, not a half-hearted peace, but he, but peace of the Lord Jesus Christ is with us now. Let us share it with each other saying, the peace of Christ be with you. Maybe you don't know, the Exaltation Youth Choir went out on tour on June 25th for about seven days. We went to Colorado with the stop in Amarillo on the way, and we sang a few concerts and did a lot of mission work, and we're going to show you just a glimpse of what we went through for seven days.
Will you please stand and join us to sing? May our homes be filled with dancing. God's people say. Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Today's first scripture lesson is from the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verses 1, 4 through 9, 12 through 14, and 16 through 30. Be forewarned, this is a long reading today. So get your popcorn ready and listen to the word of the Lord and the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. When they were standing before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, 
You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O oh king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O oh king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent, and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men that we threw and bound into the fire? They answered the king, True, O king. He replied, But I see four men unbound, walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their tunics were not harmed, and not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy 
against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, David. I took the much easier of the two readings today. (laughs) Listen again for God speaking to you, this time from Mark's Gospel, chapter 3. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's time to heal. The world has so much pain right now. So much healing is needed right now. And we, the people of God, better start it. I have said for the past two weeks that I believe God heals us. I also believe with the Apostle Paul that we are partners with God in the reconciliation of the world. We are part of God's healing. We are part of that healing through our prayers for sure. And we are part of that healing by the way we exist and act in our world. Just touching someone is healing. Isn't that wonderful? Holding their hand, putting your arm around their shoulder, offering a hug when words will not suffice, heals. Last week, I argued that friendship is healing. Did anyone make a new friend this week? A couple people. All right. I know it's hard. I did. My next door neighbor, she invited me to her birthday party, and I went. I will keep nurturing that friendship because who knows what healing it might bring. Today, I argue for the healing power of courage. Courage is the ability to do something that frightens you or to act on one's beliefs despite disapproval or even danger. I began the week thinking that courage is rare today. So many people take the easy way, the lazy way. We don't want to stir up trouble. We are tired and we just want to go home and enjoy a nice dinner and some Netflix. Why expose ourselves to something that is hard or painful or something that might endanger our security and wealth? I'll tell you why. Because of what we believe. Because we are people who live by a set of principles, God's commands that are non-negotiable. Because we are led by the Spirit of God and her leading is not to a cushy, overstuffed, useless existence, but a meaningful one where we live as salt and light in this world. The biblical witness to this is strong. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are faced with a choice. Do they worship this golden idol King Nebuchadnezzar has set up? It's it's almost a joke that this thing is not God. Over and over again in the passage, and parts that I edited out remind us that this is just something the king set up. Or do, we, or do they live by what they believe despite the disapproval and danger that will bring? They had some good reasons to worship the golden idol. Not doing so meant the wrath of the king and a horrible death. 
John Ortberg writes, Christians living in a world as comfortable as many of us inhabit can be tempted to believe that God would never want us to struggle or face a furnace. In fact, our primary goal in life can become what might be called furnace avoidance. Have you ever found yourself praying, God, deliver me from pain, discomfort, suffering, and inconvenience. Make my life smooth. Make my journey easy. Make my years on this earth comfortable. Remove all obstacles from my path. I pray that all the time. But can you think of anyone in the Old or New Testament who never had to struggle, who had an easy journey, who avoided all trouble because of their relationship to God? No. In fact, the most faithful had lots of trouble. Moses, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, and Paul. Another reason to avoid the furnace was their position. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with Daniel, were the best and brightest in exile from Judah. We are told in earlier chapters they were handsome and wise, so they were chosen to live in the palace under these new Babylonian names. If they compromised on this one tiny thing, they could keep their positions and exert a lot of influence for God in Babylon. Except, except the God they worship said, no, you shall have no other gods before me. It's God's number one commandment. So with great courage, they refused to worship the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, no matter what the consequences, and those consequences looked awful at first. They were thrown into the furnace But it's not over till it's over. And they survived. The real consequence of their courage was that King Nebuchadnezzar blessed God, the real one, and promoted these young men. The call of our faith is always to do the right thing and let the chips fall where they may. Do the right thing and let the chips fall where they may. We have no idea what our courage will accomplish in the world. There was another unexpected consequence for these young men. Did you notice it? There were four men in the fire. Who do you think that fourth person was? An angel? Maybe. I think it was Jesus. God had promised to be with them wherever they went. Jesus promised, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. And the truth is, as the late songwriter Rich Mullins wrote, we meet the Lord in the furnace a long time before we meet him in the sky. When we choose courage, God always meets us right there. We find Jesus in Mark 3 attending the synagogue as was his habit on the Sabbath. The religious leaders have become his opponents and he knows it. They're just waiting for him to break the law. But the crazy thing is that this miracle does not involve any violation of Sabbath law. When doing good is a matter of helping someone, no rabbi would argue against it, Sabbath or not. Jesus' question, is it lawful to do good or do harm, to save a life or to kill, is an easy one. The answer would have been unanimous. You know Jesus could have helped this man tomorrow, off the Sabbath. What's one more day with a withered hand? It's not like he's terminal. Jesus put himself at risk to help this man. Jesus had the courage to heal someone when he knew it would make things harder for him. Why take the risk? His love fueled his courage. He wants this man to be whole and one more day is too long. 
His priority, his conviction is that people are more important than rules, customs, or programs. And unlike the religious leaders who amazingly were not amazed at the miracle, did not rejoice in the healing, Jesus is compassionate, helpful, and healing, even when it takes courage to be so. We're told that after this miracle is when the Pharisees and Herodians natural enemies to each other, worked together to figure out how to destroy him. Again, the consequences of Jesus' courage looked dire at his crucifixion. But the God of justice and righteousness always has the last word. And the real consequence of Jesus' courage is resurrection and new life for all of us. I said at the beginning of the week, I thought courage was rare. It's not. You just have to know where to look and how to recognize it. I read and heard story after story this week about people who spoke up, stood up, and acted in ways that might have meant disapproval or danger for them, but were surely pleasing to God. And I'll share two with you today. If you've been watching the Olympics, you know that Simone Biles dropped out of both the team and individual all-around competition and others now for mental health and safety reasons. Some will judge her harshly. For some, the principle that they will live or die on is to win at all costs. Nothing is more important than a gold medal. Worldly success is the only valid measure they will argue. I'm someone who strives for excellence in all I do. But the pressure to always be the best is enormous, crushing, and sometimes more than we can bear. This pressure has been in Plano for a long time. My senior year of high school at Plano Senior High, our drama team won second in the state. Second in the whole state of Texas. Other teachers told my drama teacher, I'm sorry. Not congratulations, but I'm sorry. During that year, six of my classmates took their own lives. There was also a heroin epidemic that year. National news covered it all. Do you think those two things might be related? I think Simone Biles showed so much courage, and I know it will bring healing to her and to athletes all over the world. God's truth is that people are more important than gold medals. People are more important than anything. God in Jesus Christ will show extreme courage to live out this conviction to accomplish our salvation. Barbara Mack shared a story in my Holy Mischief Facebook group that she may have inadvertently started a revolution in a convenience store this past week. I have cleaned up her language a little bit. She writes, I stopped to grab a water, and on the way in, I saw a homeless man sitting in the shade with his bike beside him. He was red-faced and shaky-looking. I asked if he was okay, and he told me that he was just resting. I was afraid that he didn't know he needed to stay extra hydrated with it so hot outside. There were a bunch of people in line in front of me and only one cashier, so I grabbed two waters and yelled to the cashier that I was taking one to the guy outside and I'd be right back. I'm a regular there. When I came back in, the lady in front of me turned around, hands on hips, and told me I was just enabling that homeless person that I shouldn't be wasting my money on him. In Florida right now, it's in the mid-90s with a humidity around 80%. It's a good day for heat stroke. And I told her so. I said I'd rather give him a water than call an ambulance. Barbara continues. I was going to shrug it off, let it go, 
chalk it up to ignorance and the heat making everybody cranky. And then she told me I should be ashamed of myself, that someone should call the police on him, that it should be illegal to beg for money, that people who give the homeless money just encourage them to stay homeless, and that should be illegal too. Barbara thinks, ashamed. I should be ashamed for giving some poor old guy a water. It cost a whole dollar, by the way. And I should get in trouble for making sure he didn't get heat stroke in this heat. I guess I look nice, approachable, like I wouldn't rip your head off. I am nice most of the time, but not always. I lost my temper. I told her to call a cop and report me for buying water at a convenience store. I told her that I wasn't in the mood for crazy right now, that I'm hot and tired and sick to death of stupid people. That if she had an ounce of compassion in her whole body, she'd buy him a cold drink too. That maybe she should figure out why she needs to accost complete strangers. And how about after that, she back up out of my face and out of my business and turn back around and not say another word to anyone. (laughs) It got pretty loud in there at the end, Barbara reports. Then there was dead silence in the store until someone said loudly, for real. (laughs) And the guy at the front of the line told the cashier to add a sandwich to his purchases for the guy outside. The guy behind him bought an extra ice cream. The girl behind him got changed for a 20 because that guy could probably use some cash. Every single person in line got him something, except one the now very embarrassed lady in front of me who slunk out without saying another word. When I got to the cashier, she didn't charge me for either of the waters because she was going to take him one anyway, and mine was free because of the entertainment. (laughs) When I went outside, he was eating his ice cream and drinking his water with a big old grin on his face. He didn't look shaky anymore. I said in the car, and drank my water and laughed with tears in my eyes. Now, I don't advocate chewing out strangers in line (laughs) or chewing out those who don't believe and act like we think they should. But I do encourage speaking the truth in love because this kind of courage, even in the face of possible disapproval or danger, brings healing. It transforms us and the world around us. And sometimes, like in Barbara's case, it takes just one voice to start a revolution. So that is your homework for this week. Yeah? Speak up when you see someone bullied, when you hear a racist joke. Ask someone you don't know if they need help. And if they say yes, help them. Reach outside your comfort zone to those God loves. Can we show some courage and bring God's healing to our world? Can we stand on our principles of loving God with all our heart and loving our neighbors as ourselves, no matter what the consequences? Can we make a decision to stop asking for less heat and flames? To stop asking for easier, richer, more pleasant, and more secure lives. Instead, tell Jesus where you want to go with, that you will go with him wherever he goes. Commit to walking where he leads, even if it means stepping into the furnace. Amen. Stand with me 
as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We now go to our Lord in prayer. Let us pray. O oh Lord, your unfailing love and mercy never cease, fresh as the morning and sure as the sunrise. We thank you for opportunities for rest and relaxation, for opportunities for service that proclaim your love. We ask your help and healing for those with hard diagnoses, for those facing and recovering from surgery. For those enslaved by addictions. For your church, as we strive to be faithful to the courageous work to which you have called us. We lift up those who mourn the loss of someone they love, and we lift up Suzanne Madison especially today as she has said goodbye to her father. In the tangible witness of the quilt, comfort her and give her and her family your peace through the promise we have in Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, you may give to Grace Presbyterian Church as you leave today, and our ushers will have an offering plate or always online at gracepc.org. Give to God based on the conviction that it is the right thing to do for you and for the world. I invite you to sing along with us. If you say go, we will go. If you say wait, we will wait. If you say step out on the water and they say it can't be done, we'll fix our If you say go, we will go. If you say wait, we will wait. If you say step out on the water and they say it can't. 
let us pray. Great God, we thank you for opportunities to be revolutionary as your son Jesus Christ was. We thank you for giving us a vision for a world full of justice and righteousness. We thank you that we never have to be afraid for you are with us everywhere we go. Accept the gifts we give you today and bless them so that justice will row down like mighty waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. At this table, we miraculously and mysteriously join Jesus Christ, our host, and all who are in Christ today and all those who have gone before us. This is the Lord's table. All who trust in him are invited to partake in this feast which he has prepared. Let us pray. Great God, we thank you for the gift of creation, the gifts of life and love, of relationship with you and other people. We have not been faithful in those relationships. You sent prophets to call us back, You came in Jesus Christ to show us what true love is. Through his death and resurrection, our sins are forgiven and we share in his eternal life. Pour out your spirit upon this bread and this cup that it may be for us Christ's body and blood. Send us out into the world in his name, full of the peace, joy, and love this meal imparts. All honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. On the night before he died, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He said, this is the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins, for the forgiveness of your sins and mine. And now every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's saving death until he comes again. And he is coming again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will the servers please come forward? I invite you now, come and be filled.
Let us pray. Loving God, you graciously feed us. May we who have received the sacrament be strengthened in your service. We who have sung your praises tell of your glory and truth. We who have seen the greatness of your love see you face to face in your kingdom by the death and the resurrection of your son and the life-giving power of your spirit. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, as you go forth from this place, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>